my name is Paulig Murphy, um, and I'm glad to welcome you all to the uh, first webinar of the Institute uh, in the new season. It's the rentrée in Dublin, so to speak. Um, I chair the foreign policy group in the uh, Institute for International and European Affairs. And uh, we are very happy and very lucky to have today speak to us uh, the director of the Centre for European Reform, Charles Grant, uh, who um, is in fact a, a founder of the Centre for European Reform, as well as now being its director, and is uh, well known um, in um, circles that are concerned with Brexit, uh, with Russia, with China. So uh, we couldn't have uh, a better um, uh, presenter of the situation as it is today in Belarus than Charles. Um, Charles uh, will speak for 15 to 20 minutes and uh, the event as a whole as well as the question and answer session afterwards is on the record. Uh, if you have questions uh, I would urge you to um, use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen in order to put your question and to do this uh, during the presentation so that uh, we have uh, a, a raft of questions, so to speak, uh, that Charles can deal with as soon as he's finished speaking. Um, so when you're putting your question, um, please identify yourself and your affiliation if that is uh, appropriate. Uh, Charles, the floor is yours. Uh, you're very welcome again. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. very much, Frederick. Um, it is a great pleasure to be back, at least uh, virtually, in, at the Institute. Um, so can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good, sorry, I'm, my, my internet's slightly dodgy, but hopefully it'll, it'll hold up. Great, great to be back with you guys. I've, I, I haven't, I've lost count. It's probably five or six times I've spoken at your Institute since the Centre for European Reform was established 20, 20 odd to 22 years ago. It's a great pleasure to be back. The first time I've been asked to speak about Belarus. I just explain on a personal note that uh, I first visited Belarus about 15 years ago, and on a subsequent visit, I met the lady who's become my wife. So I do have a, a close personal interest in Belarus. In fact, my wife has just returned from there with our little boy. I haven't been there this summer, but as I usually go there in the summer, that my wife's been there. She's t telling me what's going on there. Uh, I'm afraid the, 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 the headline really is that I don't think it's looking too good for those of us who wish to see a peaceful democratic reform in Belarus. It's not looking so good. In the long run, who knows what will happen. In the short run, Mr. Lukashenko, who's been in charge for 26 years, looks like staying in charge. What I'm going to do in my remarks today is explain why I think he is, at least in the short term, winning. What, what, the, what is actually going on in, in terms of the opposition movement, what the nature of the, of the incipient revolution is. I'm going to look at the causes of the current unrest and then a bit about the EU's own role and what, what, if anything, the EU can do to help advance things in the right direction. So firstly, uh, why is Lukashenko winning in the short term? I mean, it's now three, three, or three or more weeks since the elections happened, since the popular protests erupted. The regime is not crumbling. Uh, and why he's, it's not crumbling because it is willing to be very brutal. The regime is not splintering. There are no members of the elite breaking off to join the opposition. Uh, they are arresting lots of people, they are still torturing people, they are beating up people, and is not succeeding in uh, terrorizing demonstrators into quiescence. But it is, does mean that uh, the regime itself is hanging together. I think there's a kind of band of brothers spirit linking together members of the political elite and the security establishment. And they think they will sink or swim together and they are very reluctant to uh, talk to the opposition but not talking to the opposition and they think that as soon as they show a sign of weakness they're finished so they're hanging on grimly and knowing that they control the monopoly of the use of force and so long as they do uh there's no reason really why 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 they should at least in the short term have to give up power the the um the nature of the regime in in belarus is actually rather different to that in russia with it's with which it's often compared in in russia the, after the end of the soviet union the indus main industries were privatized, so you have oligarchs in Russia, or potentially alternative centers of power. You don't have oligarchs in Belarus. That's because 
everything is state owned. It's much more like the Soviet Union than any other bit of the former Soviet Union. The big industries are state owned and uh, they are controlled by friends of Mr. Lukashenko, not oligarchs, but friends who are rotated uh, to keep them loyal. And so there are very few alternative centers of power within the country. Everything, everybody who's, who's anybody in Belarus is, is somebody who's part of the kind of friends of Lukashenko gang. And that makes it very hard for the regime to splinter indeed. There's what the Russians call a vertical of power. I, I detect very little sign of members of the elite uh, splintering off and joining the opposition. I mean, certainly, I think the governor of Grodno, a town in the west of the country, has resigned because he supported the opposition. And some important TV journalists have resigned because they support the opposition. But these are not the key people who really matter, unfortunately. The second reason why Lukashenko can perhaps relax a little and think he's holding on to power is, it, is the way the opposition works. The opposition doesn't have any guns, it doesn't have any organization, it doesn't have a clear structural, le structural leadership, which in some ways is good and in some ways it's bad. It's good because it means it's very hard to kill the opposition off. If they arrest a few people as they've done, the still others will, will jump up to take their place. So the opposition uh, can't be destroyed and will go on demonstrating week after week, as, as far as I can see at the moment. It'll do that. Um, but the bad thing about being a structuralist opposition is th there's, there's no mechanism for, for seizing power and taking control. Very little organization indeed. This is a very grassroots organization, the opposition. Um, and I think that it's, current, uh, it's the current way it's, uh, the current way it's evolving. I think they're moving towards a sort of philosophy of nonviolent resistance. So they hope they can, in the long run, triumph through nonviolent resistance. And so everybody's busy reading up about Gandhi and and Opcor in Serbia and other examples of nonviolent resistance. And I, you know, we all wish them luck. And there's some very, very good people in the opposition. Of course, what's been notable is, is that women have played a huge role in the opposition movement. And I can't think of another revolution or, or quasi-revolution where this has been the case. This has helped to maintain it nonviolent, which is very good. Uh, so nobody can accuse the opposition of, of violence or, in, or threatening behavior, which gives the, makes it harder for the regime to intervene against them. I mean, the three ladies who led the opposition just in the run-up to the election itself, uh, Mrs. Tikhonovskaya, Mrs. Um, Mrs. Setkala, and, uh, and Mrs. Kolesnikova, uh, who was representing Babarika, the third candidate, really did extremely well. Uh, but of, of those three, only Kolesnikova is now, uh, is now at liberty in, in the country because Mrs. Tikhonovskaya, as you know, has fled to Lithuania and Mrs. Setkala has fled elsewhere. I'm not sure where she is. So that's the opposition. Uh, so they've got some good people and good women in particular playing a prominent role, but they're not, they don't have a mechanism for seizing control. So control will not pass to the opposition or to anybody new unless some elements of the regime agree to a dialogue with the opposition and they don't have any incentives to do so. And the third reason why Mr. Lukashenko could relax is Russia. Now his, Mr. Lukashenko's relationship with Vladimir Putin is, is very is long running and very complicated. They do not like each other at all. For very many years, Mr. Putin's been trying to uh, persuade Mr. Lukashenko to accept the so-called Union State. That was an agreement that dates back to 1996 when the two countries agreed to set up a sort of joint union. Uh, subsequently, the Belarusians have stalled on that. Uh, they don't particularly want either, both both government and, and more moderate and democratic forces don't want to be part of Russia or more integrated into Russia. They stalled on that. They have agreed to stay part of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is the Russian-led equivalent of NATO. And Belarus has been a founding member of the Eurasian Economic Union, which is the Russian-led equivalent to the European Union. It has resisted measures to integrate its currency with that of with the Russian ruble. It's resisted uh, efforts of Russia to push forward uh, more defense cooperation. There is some defense cooperation. There are two military bases of Russia in Belarus, but the Russians always want to do more and the Belarusians are not so happy about that. And Lukashenko, I guess to be fair to him, has, has, has wriggled and squirmed and uh, used every technique he can to avoid Russia's embrace in recent years. And one of his techniques has been to play off Russia against the West. So every time he got too close to Russia, he would flirt with the rest with the West. He released political prisoners in 2015 so that 
the EU eliminated the sanctions in 2016 and America reduced its sanctions in 2016. He's played this game, but he's run on a road now, Lukashenko, in that respect, because he's, his recent behaviour is so bad from the West's point of view that we will not embrace him or play games with him. He's really got no alternative to go to than Russia, which is bad for Lukashenko's desire to stay under Russia's clutches, but good for his desire to stay in power, because he needs Russian help now. He needs Russia's financial help, Russia's security support. And if he gets that support, um, he will, he can probably stay in power, at least in the, in the medium term. But of course, Russia has its price. Russia has its price. If Russia does want further integration. Now, I don't claim to know what's going on in Mr. Putin's head, but I imagine that he would like to push forward the union state agenda with a closer relationship, economic and security. And he's quite happy to have a weak government in Belarus, because the weaker the government, the more dependent it is on Russian favours. And the Russians do regard Belarus as part of what they call the Ruski Mir, the Russian world, the Russian-speaking world. They don't regard it as a foreign country. That's rather like the English don't see Wales as a foreign country. Perhaps the English don't see Ireland as a foreign country. That's another bigger question we won't get into today. But uh, like the English see Wales, as sort of very close but a little bit different. That's how the Russians see, uh, see Belarus. Uh, and uh, the Russians also have a very paranoid uh, view of the West's intentions in Belarus. Russians are saying at the moment that these demonstrations we're seeing are the result of intervention by Lithuanian and Polish security forces, which of course is not true. But I think, not, of course, it's, it's propaganda as well as paranoia. But I think from my knowledge of Russia, some of the Russians actually believe this kind of stuff. Whereas Mr. Putin and his friends are so paranoid, they don't believe that the Ukrainian revolutions of 2004 and 2014 were anything to do with the Ukrainian people wanting to break free of Russia and run their own affairs. They actually are convinced that it's the CIA and other operatives pushing and pushing forward an agenda for change in Ukraine. And they have a similar view of, of what's happening in Belarus. But they really are wrong. In Ukraine in 2014, uh, there was a, an anti-Russian element, there was a nationalist element in the revolution of, of the Maidan protests. So far, that is not the case in Belarus. Most Belarusian people are not anti-Russian. They really are not. They have rather a rosy view of Russia because they watch, a lot of them watch Russian television. They don't even have a particularly negative view of Mr. Putin. But so that's not what this revolution is about. This revolution is not an anti-Russian revolution at all. It is, it's not a nationalist revolution. It's a democracy revolution. It's about rule of law, freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, anti-corruption, getting rid of the man who's been the dictator for 26 years. That's what it's about. And of the people demonstrating, some of them are probably would like to make the country more pro-Western, others not particularly. Others don't mind being close to Russia at all. But that's not, the, it's very important that people in the West don't, in my view, give Lukashenko and Putin an excuse for, for, for military intervention by trying to, you know, say, let's get Belarus into NATO, let, even let's get Belarus into the EU. That's not what's, what's on the agenda for now. What I think we in the West should focus on is, is getting, making sure that Belarus, the Belarusian people can choose their own rulers. So, so that's where, sorry, so to digress slightly, but I think my point is that we saw a couple of days ago, Mr. Putin said, if Mr. Lukashenko needs help, we have a special reserve of security forces who will go and help him. He doesn't really need to do that yet, Mr. Putin, because I think Mr. Lukashenko is sadly in control anyway. I think the risks of a Russian invasion of Belarus are very small indeed, because the Russians must have enough uh, intelligence um, in, in the sense of security intelligence to know that if they do invade Belarus, then Belarusian people will not be so pro-Russian. If they invade Belarus to snuff out a revolution, then the Belarusian people will turn against the Russians and Russia will lose the goodwill and support of the people there as it's rather done in, in Ukraine and Georgia in recent years. Um, so I don't think Russia needs to invade or will invade. If it did invade, it'd be very costly in terms of blood, treasure and reputation, because the, the West would certainly impose very strict sanctions on Russia. But I think probably Mr. Putin reckons he can get his way without invading, just through informal cooperation. There has been a lot of cooperation already between the Russian security services and the Belarusian ones. And some of the techniques the Belarusians have used for dealing with the crowds and the demonstrators have clearly been taught to them by the Russians. That, a little bit less, less brutality and more subtlety in the last few days. Um, and I, the, the, from the, from, I mean, if I was to meet Mr. Putin, who I have actually met a few times as part of something called the Valdai Club, I would say to him, do let Belarus go down the, the Armenian route. That is surely the best possible model 
for, our, for, for Belarus's future that could conceivably work, i.e. in 2018, Armenia underwent a sort of, sort of democratic revolution. I'm not an expert on Armenia, I should hasten to add, but there was a sort of revolution there to kick out a particularly corrupt regime. And the new government that came in is more democratic than the one that preceded it, but it has not sought to annoy Russia. It's staying in the CSTO, it's staying in the Eurasian Economic Union, and it's therefore made quite clear to Russia that it doesn't seek a geopolitical revolution in Armenia's place in the world. And therefore, the Russians have left it alone and have not intervened. And I hope that in the long run, Russia will come to accept an Armenian model for Belarus. It would be great if they did. The trouble is, I think that, and I'm, again, I'm speculating, I think the people in the Kremlin probably think that Belarus matters rather more than Armenia. Minsk is a lot closer to Moscow than Yerevan. Uh, so I, I do worry that the Russians won't accept an Armenian model, but that is what I think we have to push them to do and hope that they will do so. So those are the reasons why I, I'm a little bit pessimistic in the short, at least the short term, about uh, what's, what's happening in Belarus, and why I think Mr Lukashenko is secure. But let me just, just move now to a little bit on, on, um, on, uh, on what, why there's been the kind of change that there has been in Belarus, because I think understanding what is, what is changing there is important for us to understand what may happen in the future. One point I'd make is that Mr. Lukashenko, as far as I can tell, has been a fairly popular figure for much of the time as he's been running Belarus. It's very hard to be sure because there aren't any really good objective sources of opinion polling, but my own anecdotal experience of what I've read from others who are more expert than me, he has been fairly popular. He was fairly popular because Belarus has been a fairly well-run country. People in Belarus talk of it being a southern Baltic country, and there is a little bit in that. It's quite a clean country, it's quite an efficient country, the state works fairly well. It's fairly well organised, perhaps, compared to Ukraine. And it's actually been a bit less corrupt than Ukraine because there aren't any oligarchs. There is corruption, of course, but it's not, not the sort of Ukrainian or Russian style of corruption because there aren't oligarchs in, in Belarus. Um, so, sorry, uh, where was I? Uh, it's, it's about, um, about, yes, about, 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 yes, about why he's been popular. And there was a sort of social contract, an informal social contract has operated in Belarus between uh, the regime and the people, whereby the regime delivered stability and prosperity and rising living standards. But in return, um, the people accepted they didn't have political freedoms that others had in the West, and they just got on with their lives. And could, they were allowed to travel quite easy, easy to travel and so on. And that social contract has really uh, been undermined in the last year or two because the economy's not done so well. Uh, the Russians have been subsidizing the economy. and They've reduced their subsidies. The Russians have been giving Belarus very cheap oil, which Belarusian industrial companies refine, turn into oil products and sell to the West. And that's basically been a lot of the source of the country's prosperity. The Russians has removed or is in the process of removing gradually the subsidies on the oil. So um, the Belarusian economy has taken a modernized economy. It is still very Soviet. There's still a big focus on tractor production and a lot of heavy industries and making chassis for missile launches and so on. Uh, the one good bit of the economy is the IT sector. There is quite an advanced IT sector in Belarus, but otherwise there's not much of a modern economy. And Mr. Lukashenko has refused to privatize industry or modernize the economy because he fears if he does do what the IMF has told him he should do, then people will be laid off and there'll be political unrest and he'd lose the social base of his support. So the economy is a real worry and a real problem. And that's one of the reasons why there is a lot of discontent. Because living standards have been drifting downwards in the last five years or so. Of course, they're likely to go down further. The second reason why there's so much unrest in Belarus is COVID-19. There's something about strong men that makes them unable to understand the risks involved when a nasty pandemic uh, comes along. I mean, Trump and Trump in America, Bolsonaro in Brazil, and Lukashenko in Belarus have a lot in common. They didn't take COVID-19 seriously, but Lukashenko was actually worse than, than the other two names I mentioned. He didn't have a lockdown at all. There was no lockdown in Belarus. I think the only country in Europe, apart from Sweden, that didn't have a lockdown, maybe one other, I forgot, I don't know. And as a result, it was much worse than it should have been. Uh, the, the official figures are that Belarus didn't get too badly affected, but the official figures are almost certainly, well, they are certainly wrong, they're certainly underestimation. In fact, it may not have been 
that badly affected compared to, say, the United Kingdom. But nevertheless, it was worse affected than people, uh, than the official figures said. And people became scared. And because the government took no initiative at all, and because Mr. Lukashenko said, if you drink vodka and drive a tractor and go to the sauna, you will not get COVID-19. Even people who had supported him for many years thought, hang on, this is a bit crazy. People became scared and civil society began to organize. And there was a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of very important sort of uh, civil society groups grew up during the COVID-19 epidemic in the spring to look after people who were at high risk, to look after health workers, to come do shopping for old people and so on. So more than ever before, in my experience, civil society really took off in Belarus in the spring. So that was the second reason why there's so much annoyance with the government. And the third reason uh, is that the, the reaction to the brutality of the regime. Because when uh, the elections approached and the three serious opposition candidates emerged, and uh, when they were locked up, uh, and uh, the, the people who people, there were hundreds of thousands of people queued to sign the nomination papers for the opposition candidates. This has never been seen before in Belarus. Literally hundreds of thousands, the queue stretched for mile after mile. They just wanted to sign the nomination papers. Something, something was happening. What was happening was people were getting very angry with the regime for being so brutal in the way it was detaining opposition leaders and their entourages and their families and their staffs. So the, the behavior of the regime gave a further provocation to civil society to get organized. And then subsequent to the election itself, the behavior of the regime is even worse. A lot of people have been beaten up and tortured. People have been murdered by the regime. Nobody knows how many. So there are certainly four deaths. Other people have just disappeared and haven't uh, prominently been murdered. There may, be, there may be several dozen deaths. Nobody knows. But there, everybody knows that there's been lots of beatings going on. People have seen happen. And this is this is this has provoked people to demonstrate. That's why they've been brave enough to demonstrate day after day, weekend after weekend, despite the arrests and the fact that the detentions and the, the risks they've undergone. So that's so the, the short. What I'm trying to say is, uh, even though Luk Lukashenko is in charge for now, the country has changed. The country has changed for the better in many ways. People have woken up. They, they do what they may not want to join the EU or NATO, but they do want to, they want democracy and they want to look after themselves and choose their own leaders. And they're fed up and they hate this man. They really hate him. And they want to go on. And my own estimate is by probably at least three quarters of the people or more want him gone. And the numbers of people who really still support the regime is rather small. It's those who are linked to the security establishment, those who probably fear for their futures if the regime falls. It's, it's the, those very closely linked to the regime. Um, just finally, just a word about the European Union, then I'll, then I'll stop. Um, the EU sadly doesn't have very many levers it can pull. The EU would love to help the opposition, but it just doesn't have levers. There's, it doesn't give very much aid. It only gives a few tens of millions of pounds of aid a year to the country directly, which is peanuts. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development is very active in the country, as is the European Investment Bank. And certainly it would, it would cost the country quite a lot if they pulled out. But I think the EU isn't in a hurry to pull those institutions out because they believe they do rather a lot of good. And what the EU's dilemma is it doesn't want to do things that will hurt the people. It doesn't want to block trade with Belarus because that would hurt the people. It wants to hurt the regime, but not the people. And that's difficult. So what it's going to do, what it is doing is targeted sanctions, picking out the listed individuals who are guilty of human rights abuse or electoral fraud and uh, having visa sanctions on them so that they cannot travel and bank sanctions so that they cannot have bank accounts in EU countries. And this will certainly hurt a bit for the elite because they do like to travel to Vilnius and do their shopping there. And they do like to, sort of, to, to, to have foreign bank accounts in, in nice places they can visit. It's, but it's not, going to change, it's not going to change the behavior of the regime in very short term. I think that it does take rather a long time for the EU to act. It takes, because it's a lot of legal issues involved, it's going to take the EU a week or two yet before it has its list ready. Uh, so I don't think, one thing the EU can do is hold out, of course, it can hold out carrots as well as sticks. It can say, look, if, if we have a democratic government in the country, then, uh, then we can give you billions of pounds of aid. The EU has, has the budget to do that. It can do that to help you go through the difficulties of economic reform, which you must go through. In fact, the, the Lukashenko regime did ask for, for balance of payment support in the spring, and the EU said no. 
it can do that to a more friendly regime. It can offer sticks and carrots, but the sticks, as I'm saying, are relatively limited. Um, and uh, there is, of course, Belarus is a member of the EU's Eastern Partnership alongside Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and, uh, and Armenia. But, it, but it's, it, it's, 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 it doesn't take up a lot of the programs uh, in that Eastern Partnership compared to the others. And again, I think the EU is reluctant to, to push it out of the Eastern Partnership for fear of that hurting the people, the people themselves. But that may be something that happens. Maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense to keep Belarus in the EU's Eastern Partnership, given what's actually happening. And that's something that you will have to work out in the future. To be fair to the EU, it is fairly united on Belarus. Um, and it's fairly united in taking measures. But what I worry about Hungary, because uh, Viktor Orban is a friend of Lukashenko, strong men seem to like each other. He went to Lukashenko to meet him in June and said, well, there shouldn't be any EU sanctions on Belarus. But luckily he's kind of kept quiet since then and he hasn't, Hungary has not actually intervened to try and stop sanctions in the last few weeks, perhaps because his friends in Poland, in the Law and Justice Party in Poland, are taking a very tough line on Belarus and Hungary has enough fights to pick with the EU anyway, enough fights to fight with the EU on other issues mode and doesn't think Belarus is, is worth expending uh, gunpowder on. So touch wood, it's okay for the Hungarians. The Cypriots and the Greeks are potentially difficult because they are so annoyed that the EU has not taken sanctions against Turkey because of what's happening in the Eastern Mediterranean at the moment. They are threatening to veto sanctions on Belarus. I suspect they won't in the end. And anyway, the EU may well take action on Turkey. So the EU is fairly united. The Germans are very much in the lead as the country that takes a strong interest in Belarus. Austria is an interesting country. Austria is the biggest investor in Belarus of the European countries hasn't tried to prevent sanctions, but has huge uh, links. Uh, Austrian Airlines is big there, Austrian banks are big there, and so on. So watch, watch out for Austria, but perhaps potentially a problem. So the EU, in my view, it's fair to criticize the EU for being a bit sleepy and a bit slow and not doing more, but I'm not sure there's a lot more it can do. Whatever it does, it has to work with the US. I'm not sure what's happening in the US about Belarus. The US has been trying to improve its ties with Belarus in the last year or two. It's opening, a, it's upgrading its ambassadorship in Belarus to full ambassador level. It's given oil supplies to Belarus when the Russians cut them off uh, earlier in the year. And it, it, I think it frankly isn't, isn't, well, Mr. Trump clearly not very interested in human rights. And I think the State Department would be more interested in the geopolitical game of trying to pull Belarus away from Russia. When, when, the, when the elections happened and the fraud was, became clear, Mr. Pompeo, the Secretary of State, did speak out quite forcefully against what was happening in the country. So he would work with international partners in deciding what to do, but there's absolutely nothing has happened. I don't know what's going on in the US, but they don't, they're not talking about sanctions at all. The British, at least, are saying they will join the EU in taking sanctions. Of course, the British on their own couldn't do anything. So the British, as far as I understand, will follow whatever the EU does, but they have to until the end of this year anyway while they're in the transition period. And afterwards, they'll probably work with the EU as well. But the US, I don't know what's happening. Um, I think I'm coming to the end of my remarks, Padre. Just let me, end, let me just try and sort of put my, my, uh, my, take up my crystal balls and what's going to happen. I don't actually know what's going to happen, of course. I do think, as, as I've said already, uh, Mr. Lukashenko will remain in charge in the short term. But in the long run, who knows? Civil society is a lot stronger than it was. What I fear is that Russia will increase its hold over the country in the short and medium term, because Lukashenko so much depends on Russian help. You'll have to give the Russians some of what they want. That'll make Russia a more influential player than it is already. And that in itself may turn the opposition movement in Belarus from being not anti-Russian to a bit anti-Russian. The more the Russians intervene, the more they will turn the people against them, against Russians. And ultimately, the people in Belarus have to sort out their own affairs. But I, I, and I don't know what's going to happen, but I fear it may, things may get worse before they get better. I hope I'm wrong. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Charles. Um, thank you for a, a very nuanced presentation of the complicated situation in uh, Belarus. Um, as you say, um, uh, in the short term, uh, Lukashenko will um, probably still uh, call the shots, but uh, as you also rightly say, uh, he is perceived as having run out of road uh, by a large part of his own population. And uh, there are uh, a number of reasons for this, the economic one, the pandemic one, uh, the reaction to brutality that you mentioned, 
uh, but uh, perhaps uh, the most important one is that he is in power for 26 years. And um, the position of um, Belarus in the uh, general uh, European uh, overall situation uh, is not uh, very clear because he has played games for these 26 years uh, between uh, Russia and the West. Um, the question uh, then is, uh, as you also raised, what does the EU do about it? And here it seems to me that um, something that Karl Bildt has said is uh, very important and indeed others have said it too, uh, that is, we are not playing a geopolitical game in Belarus. And of course, that uh, reduces the, um, um, the possibilities for us uh, to engage. Um, if the US engaged fully, I think it would become a geopolitical game. And perhaps we have a, a lot of reasons to uh, hope that this will not happen. In regard to this kind of dilemma, uh, there are a couple of questions uh, one from Alan Dukes, uh, former finance minister um, here, uh, who uh, asks about the role of the OSCE, in particular about new elections under the auspices of the OSCE. And Claude Quain, um, uh, who is a member um, of the staff of the Institute, also asks uh, whether uh, the OSCE might have a role in facilitating matters there. Now, of course, the OEC is not in the strongest of positions at the moment, but nevertheless, it, it does seem to be an organization that uh, preeminently uh, could deal with this kind of question without raising these geopolitical issues. <clears throat> it's on the OEC. I think that's a very interesting point. Uh, Belarus is, of course, a member of the OEC, though it's not a member of the Council of Europe. Uh, because it has a death penalty. And the fact that ESA and Russia are still in the OSC does mean potentially the OSC is a more neutral organization for mediation than, say, the EU. So I think uh, the feeling on, when I talk to EU diplomats is just saying I think the, the OSC is, is an ideal organization. I would pick up something else you said about Carl Bildt, uh, Padre. Yeah. Um, I think it's very, very important that we don't play geopolitical games and we don't try and see this as an opportunity to grab. Belarus for the West, because if we do, then the Russians will certainly intervene, if necessary, with, a mili with military force. And that's, a, that's just the, the sad and tragic reality. But, but so, so that's why I, I said before, as that Carl Bildt has also said, the Armenian model is really what we need to aim for. Geopolitical stability, at least, at least for the time being, but, but democratic uh, processes and rule of law within, within the country. Um, Something else I didn't mention earlier, which I perhaps I just mentioned very briefly, which is the issue of immigration. One of the saddest, one of the saddest things about what's happening at the moment is a lot of people are leaving the country. And of course, the more that um, the more that uh, the regime seems to be stable and, and, and secure and in control, uh, the more people will leave the country. And that, of course, is damaging for the economy because it tends to be the bright young people who leave the country. And it's also damaging for the political process because the kind of lead, people who need, you need to lead an opposition are leaving the country. So immigration is something that worries me greatly. Quite a lot of it is it's going up, unfortunately. Yeah, um, on, on that question, we have a, an interesting observation from the uh, Netherlands ambassador here who says he was in Moscow um, between 2009 and 2012 and co covered Belarus from Warsaw uh, for the subsequent four years and served as Eastern Partnership ambassador uh, from 2016 and 2018. He says he sees a lot of similarities between uh, the demonstrators in Moscow in 2010, 2011, and Minsk now. They are young, educated, and diverse. Uh, what people in uh, Moscow and now in Minsk uh, binds is free elections, rule of law, no corruption, no joint further vision. And the government reaction then and now, he said, is also the same. Let it gradually die down, start the crackdown in the second phase, and thus win. Do you agree? I'm afraid I do. Uh, I think you, you, that, that may well be the case. I think I, I was a visitor to Moscow at the time of those demonstrations in 2010 to 2012. Mm. And I think, um, you know, just let, letting, them, letting, them, letting them drift on, I think if, as, as Putin did then and as Lukashenko is doing now, 
is what is what's is, is also as Putin is doing today in Khabarovsk in the Russian Far East. I think there's a lot of similarities between what's happening in the Russian Far East and what's happening in Minsk. And Putin knows that. That's why Putin cannot be seen to allow a color revolution to succeed in, in Minsk. Because if it did, think of the impact on other places in Russia. Think how that would inspire those in Khabarovsk and elsewhere in Russia to demonstrate themselves. So I think if Putin you know, have, have a red line of, of preventing any kind of successful color revolution in Minsk, sadly, which is why I come back to repeat myself again. I think that Arme the Armenian model is the, is the only model we can really aim for uh, and aspire to in, the, in an ideal world. Yeah, well, of course, the Armenian model involved a change of head of uh, state in Armenia. And of course, uh, the, the crux, the gravamen of the problem in Belarus is precisely um, the um, presence of uh, the continuing presence of Lukashenko. I, I suppose it, it is conceivable that in Moscow they would have other scenarios in mind as far as that is concerned. Yes, and I think it is, it is, because uh, Putin clearly doesn't like Lukashenko, that's obvious, and most people in Moscow don't like Lukashenko. Um, and if, it's, if, if I think, if at some point he seems to be so weak that he cannot continue in office, then they will look for an alternative. Um, somebody who is a more pliant uh, person, who'd be more, who could have, perhaps more, have more credibility with the Belarusian people, who would be sympathetic to Russia, but there, but there isn't such a person at the moment. I mean, nobody can think who that person would be right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and one, well, perhaps just to, 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 to add something I said um, earlier, I think, I think about a week ago, or maybe two weeks ago, it did look like the regime was almost crumbling because the, the, the state and enterprises went on strike. When they went on strike, I thought, hey, this is maybe the end, and, the, and the, a lot of TV journalists walked out. And unfortunately, they broke the strikes. They broke the strikes by arresting the ringleaders and threatening to sack everybody else. So the, most of the state of enterprises are more or less back at work, as far as I know now. So that industrial action failed. And that's why I think, uh, I think it is quite plausible to imagine that, that Lukashenko will just wait and wait for the protest to peter out. They, they may not peter out, uh, but of course, when the weather gets worse in the autumn, that, that'll be one, one to deter more people demonstrating. Yeah, well, the protests may peter out, but as you said, Lukashenko also has run out of the road. Uh, we have a question from Ben Tonra in UCD here, uh, who asks, what can you tell us about the strategy of the opposition over the next few days, weeks, or weeks? And I think you have said a certain amount about that already um, in terms of the absence of structure in the opposition and perhaps uh, following the absence of structure, the, uh, the absence of organized tactics. But nevertheless, it's an interesting question. Um, what, what do you know about that? <clears throat> I can't say much more than I said already, I'm afraid. And I think, uh, uh, as, as we said, there isn't any structure. And that is both good and, and bad in different ways. Um, there's certainly a very strong focus on non-violence. Uh, there's a certain very strong focus on sort of civic rights and civic issues. A, and, and those people in the opposition who are sort of, if one say, could say old fashioned nationalists, have been pushed aside. They are not being allowed to dominate and run things. Those people who, who are kind of want to focus on history and the past and great heroes in Belarusian history, and the, the short lived Republic of 1918, those people have been sidelined. Those people in charge of the opposition, or if there is anybody in charge, are much more focused on on civil, civil liberties, on civic, sort of civic issues, um, or, uh, not, for, not trying, to avoid, to, trying to avoid it being a national revolution, because they know that if, they, if it comes to national revolution, then the Russians will be you know, very, very quickly involved in a negative sense. So I think um, that will continue. A lot of the, I mean, the women's side is very important. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of focus on soft power and kind of women's issues. I think that will remain, as I said before, I think there are a lot of people in Belarus are today buying books about Mahatma Gandhi and reading up about Otpor in Serbia and the Serbian movement that led to the downfall of, of Milosevic uh, 20 years ago. And they're trying to learn about peaceful resistance, non-violent resistance. Of course, non-violent resistance worked in British India because the British didn't, didn't bump off Gandhi. They locked him up, they didn't kill him. And I guess uh, non-violent resistance really only works if, if the regime is, is relatively civilized. And how civilized Mr. Lukashenko's regime is, I'm, I just don't know. Yeah, we have a, a couple of questions um, on um, the reliability of, <clears throat> of the uh, EU. 
Um, one from Valerie Hughes uh, quotes uh, Donald Tusk as saying uh, to Belarus that all the people of uh, Europe and across the world stand with you. Um, and that the same thing was said uh, in 2012 uh, to Syria. Um, does, do you think that the EU will sustain its support for Belarus? And then uh, Donald Denham uh, says that um, uh, the, uh, similarly that the rhetoric of the EU uh, is perhaps uh, not enough um, and it's further weakened by Brexit, and as uh, he asks, is Russia once again to be the beneficiary of the present disruption in Belarus? Uh, a wise man that could answer that kind of question, but uh, it is a dilemma that people see. Well, that, that's all, those are all very fair and very good uh, points to make. Um, I think there is a danger, of course, with the EU foreign policy machine that its rhetoric runs ahead of reality and it over promises and under delivers. That's why I'm, I've always said on Belarus, we should be very modest about what we in the EU, and I sorry, I say we in the EU, I live in a country that's left the EU, that we in the EU can achieve is be very modest because we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, lead anybody in Belarus or elsewhere to think that we can, we can change history easily or quickly or simply. It's just not life is, isn't, isn't that easy, unfortunately. Foreign policy life isn't that easy. I think what, what we can do is nudge in, nudge in certain directions by, um, by creating in sticks, by, it's incentive structure through sticks and carrots. But I do think uh, the EU has overdone the, the strategic caution. Because it got burnt in, 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 in Ukraine, I mean, in, in Ukraine, the EU took a lot of stick for charging in with the association agreement without realizing how the Russians would react and then provoking the, 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 the events of 2014 and the Russian intervention, which actually is, is, is not fair or, or it's not a true record of what happened. I followed this very closely at the time. In fact, the EU did try and warn uh, the Russians about, about the uh, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement that it was wanted to do with Ukraine. At every EU summit there was over a period of several years, the EU told Mr. Putin about it. He wasn't interested, he didn't care about it, it was boring. Then just, uh, just in 2013, somebody said to Putin, hang on, Ukraine can't join the Eurasian Economic Union if it does this trade deal with the EU. Then Putin said, hang on, what? We've got to stop that. So Putin had got very angry and tried to stop the DCFTA between the EU and Ukraine in 2014. So I, I'm digressing, but that's because with the trial, nevertheless, a lot of people, including Boris Johnson, blamed the EU at the time for the, what happened in Ukraine. In my view, very unfairly. But because of that, the EU is very worried about provoking a Russian intervention in Belarus. So when I talk to EU officials, they say to me, gosh, we, you know, we, we want to help the people there, but we, if, we, if we give them too much help or intervene too strongly, then that'll give, uh, that, that'll give Lukashenko and his regime no option but to go cap in hand to the Russians and do some sort of deal to uh, give, get money and help from the Russians in return for giving up sovereignty. And we do want, and a European objective is to maintain the sovereignty and integrity of the Belarusian state as an independent state. So the EU is, is understandably reluctant to provoke a Russian intervention, but I think they overdo it. I think, of course, you have to think about the consequences of what you do, and of course you have to be careful and cautious. But ultimately, the EU is, is an institution based on values. And if the EU betrays its values by forgetting about its, its support for democracy and human rights in Belarus, then, then it's not going to, not only will it not be popular with the people of Belarus, it'll lose popularity with its own people inside the European Union. Because ultimately, if the EU is not a values-based organisation, it is nothing. Those values have to be tempered by a bit of realism, but they have to, they have to be maintained, those values. So I, I think the EU needs to be a bit more outspoken and a bit more active and move a bit quicker and, and, uh, and be prepared to do a bit more without, without being under any illusion that it has the ability to actually click its fingers and say that Belarus will be democratic. Yeah, and I suppose there is a um, the question of the the born child trading the fire because in, in the case of Ukraine, uh, geopolitical considerations were very definitely in play. And um, there is a sense in, in Brussels and in the EU uh, that um, the geopolitical play was mishandled perhaps. Um, and hence um, the uh, perhaps excessive caution in Belarus. I have another couple of questions. Um, Somebody asks um, whether um, if the uh, Belarus uh, security services um, lose um, uh, power or if 
with all their support uh, to Lukashenko, will we see the arrival of little green men? I think perhaps you have answered that, but nevertheless, um, there is also the question uh, from um, John Kerr. Um, will we see the nomenclature splitting as it has in Armenia? Um, that's also something. And then there is a question from somebody, uh, Paul Johnston, asking, uh, could NATO and the EU uh, make it more clear publicly and privately uh, that all this talk of um, NATO mobilizing is uh, nonsense? Uh, three uh, questions um, which you may find interesting to answer. Thank you. Well, on, on the last one, I think, I think, yes, of course, Mr. Lukashenko is saying that NATO is mobilizing, that NATO troops are approaching the southwest border of the country, which is not really true. I mean, there are, the, the NATO does do exercises sometimes, but there's nothing happening because of the current crisis. More than would happen anyway. I think NATO perhaps could say a bit more forcefully that nothing is happening. I think I'd be, I'd be happy if NATO said a bit more forcefully and, and you know, we, nobody in NATO is ever talking about Belarus joining NATO, which, which is true, but it's really, it's really not on the agenda for the people in, Ukraine, in Belarus at the moment. Nobody in Belarus in, the, in taking part in the demonstration saying, let's join NATO. It really isn't on the agenda, but it would suit Lukashenko very well if, if people in the West start talking about joining NATO, if some people in Washington and think tanks in Washington start talking about Belarus joining NATO. That would suit them fine. That would give them an excuse to intervene and to get more, more paranoid and, and to clamp down more. So I think it's very important to say that um, to try and do everything we can to make it quite clear that NATO is not interested in Belarus at the moment. Uh, European Union, I think, you know, similarly, no, nobody in the EU really wants Belarus to join the, join the EU in, in the foreseeable future. You should never say never because European countries do have the right to join the EU. You, can't, you shouldn't say never, but you can say not, not for the time being. Um, on, the, on, the, on the point about the Russians sending in little green men, I, I, well, they have sent in some already. They've certainly, the head of the Russian KGB, the, sorry, FSB rather, has been, been to Belarus at least, at least on two, two times in the last week or two. And I think there's a lot of um, technical, uh, practical, organizational support going on already that the Russians are helping the Belarusian authorities with already. Um, but if the secret, if, if the Belarusian secret services were to stop supporting Lukashenko, then I think the Russians would quite likely intervene. But um, the other question was about the signs of the nomenclature that it's supposed to be. At the moment, no. The people in the nomenclature want to hold on to their jobs, their money, their privileges, their power position, their swanky cars, their dachas, and they do not want to uh, start talking to the opposition because if they do, they could be killed or locked up and they'd lose their privilege, privilege of life. And they're betting on Lukashenko surviving for another few years. After he survived for 26 years, why couldn't he survive for another four or five years? Until his son is old enough to take over. We haven't talked about the family, but, but Lukashenko's son, Kolya, is 15. It goes everywhere with him. And is, it seems to be being groomed to, for the replacement, you know, right in North Korean style. But uh, I think Lukashenko wants to go on until Kolya is old enough to take over. That'll be some time, unfortunately. He goes, he goes everywhere with him and is often seen and was seen as a child in a military uniform. And I think it was seen also um, in the past week in a military uniform. Um, another question, which is a, a very interesting one from uh, Claude Quain, who is a researcher there. And that is about um, um, Emmanuel Macron. Um, Emmanuel Macron has over the past couple of years uh, pursued the policy of keeping a channel uh, open to um, President Putin, and he has talked about Russia rejoining the G7, G8. Um, she wonders um, what uh, the effect of the events in Belarus might be on this. And indeed, I would add, uh, one could also ask what the effect of uh, the um, events in relation to Navalny in the past week have on this. Um, I think. Um, Emmanuel Macron must be uh, furiously thinking again. <clears throat> well, that's an interesting question you, you raised, Pedro. It's exactly a year since he came up with the idea that we should try and find a way of building bridges to Russia. Uh, his, 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 his main motivation was geostrategic. He was worried about Russia 
being too close to China and he's worried about China and the West and doesn't thought we maybe we could sort of grab Russia and pull it away from China and make it close to the West. My own view is, uh, somebody who's followed Russia for a number of years, I think you know, there's no harm in trying to see if Russia's ready to behave in what we would regard as a more civilised way. There's no harm in trying, and sounding up the Russians, see if they're ready to, to make changes that would be required for a, a close relationship. But it's clearly, as Macron's discovered, it hasn't worked. Um, to be fair to Macron, he always said that, that a better relationship with the West requires Russia to try and promote peace in Ukraine. You know, Macron always said that, and Russia is, as far as I can see, very unwilling to make the compromises required that would get peace going in Ukraine. Which isn't to say that Russia is to blame for everything in Ukraine. I mean, the Ukrainian government doesn't want to make compromises either, but I think Russia is a big part of the problem in Ukraine. Uh, and I think already that the lack of progress in Ukraine, the lack of Russia's willingness to really go for a solution in Ukraine has more or less meant that Macron's initiative has sort of petered out already before the Belarus events happened. And I guess events in Belarus haven't, haven't really changed that very much, one way or the other. Macron, to be fair, has spoken out quite strongly on Belarus. He, both he and Angela Merkel, have said to Putin, you must not intervene, and if you intervene, you'll pay a price, which is exactly what the West should say to, 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 to the Russian leadership. Um, but, I, but I don't think, um, as, as for Navalny, I guess Navalny only, only shows, sadly, to those people who are cynical about Russia's capability that Russia isn't, isn't the, the nature of the regime is not likely to change anytime soon, which makes it Macron's understandable desire to improve relations with Russia isn't going to go very far any, anytime soon. And I think the Macron initiative is, is, uh, is perhaps petering out without having achieved anything at all. Yeah, thank you. Um, if you will permit, uh, Charles, um, there are a number of questions on, on Brexit and you are also um, uh, <laughs> And, Brexit. and um, if I may say so, um, I agree completely with what you said uh, a week ago, uh, that what we were heading for was uh, a bare bones agreement, uh, but that there would be one um, at the end. Uh, the end is coming very near, and of course, uh, there have been alarms and excursions in the intervening period, which um, make one wonder again, but um, John Bruton, who is a former Taoiseach and a former EU ambassador to Washington asks, how do you think the level playing field issue can be resolved in the EU-UK free trade area negotiations? I'm happy to, to, to switch to a few questions on Brexit, if that's what we want to talk about. Um, I, I have been saying for all summer really that I thought a deal was more likely than no deal. I guess things keep on happening that make me question my assumptions. Uh, there is still time for a deal. We don't need to do a deal till for another six weeks or so, even a bit longer if necessary, six or eight weeks. A deal will require the UK government to compromise in certain areas. It will also require the EU to compromise a bit too. I think taking standing back and taking the big picture, um, where the UK really needs to compromise is on state aid. The state aid regime is the most important blockage to progress now. The British government does not want to propose any state aid regime post-transition period at all. Uh, and that is uh, obviously not acceptable to the EU, nor should it be acceptable to the EU. My guess is if the UK proposes a regime that has some sort of independent regulator that is fairly serious, it, doesn't, it wouldn't, wouldn't need to follow the EU rules exactly at all, but it needs to have a serious system of controlling state. That, that, I think that would be enough for the EU. Uh, but, but, but Dominic Cummings, the Prime Minister's most important advisor, is, um, is, is opposed to ideologically to any kind of restriction on state aid at all. The, the irony is Britain, of course, uses much less state aid than any other large member state of the EU. Compared to France and Germany and Italy, we use very little state aid. But we want the right to use it. And Cummings wants the right to subsidise a lot of new high-tech innovatory industries that, of the sort that he's very concerned about. And I think Cummings is going to have to be overruled. If Cummings is not overruled on the state aid issue, then I think we're heading for no deal. If he is overruled, there, there could well be a deal. I think where the EU has to move a bit is just the so-called parallelism. The EU saying, and it won't talk about anything else until state aid is sorted out and fish is sorted out. I think state aid, perhaps we do have to move on, but the British have to move on. But fish will, won't be done to the last minute anyway. Fish is the most politically difficult issue in the entire Brexit negotiations. It will have to be done right at the end. On the question about level playing field more generally, I think the, the solution is quite clear but the British have to promise not to, not to go backwards in their standards on social environmental issues and some other areas. 
and the EU has to uh, the EU has to uh, and the EU will have the right to punish the UK if it does go backwards. And of course, putting that into practice is very difficult. I think I think level playing field overall is solvable. It's just the state aid issue is particularly difficult, and that I think is the most difficult issue of all. So whether there can be a deal depends on whether there can be state aid. The reason why I'm optimistic in the sense of I think of a thin deal rather than no deal at all is. I think the British government really needs them. This is being objective. They're not based on gossip from number 10. I just think objectively, there is a real question mark about Boris Johnson's competence and the, and the competence of his whole government because of the way they've handled COVID-19, because of the way they've handled the, the cancelled schools exam fiasco. And if, if at the end of the year we leave without a deal, there will be chaos at the borders. There will be gaps on supermarket shelves and interruptions to supplies of key pharmaceuticals. There'll be all sorts of problems. And people, some people will say it's all the EU's fault, but some people will say it's not the EU's fault, it's actually Boris Johnson's fault. And I think he doesn't want to take a further knock his reputation for competence. And then there's the Scottish issue. I mean, if, if, you know, if I was Nicola Sturgeon, I'd be very happy if there's a no-deal Brexit, because then that will just create more doubt about whether Scotland is better off staying in the United Kingdom, led by, led by a load of incompetence who can't even do, do a Brexit deal with the EU. So I do think that the Scottish factor and the competence factor make me think that Objectively, the government wants a deal. I think Michael Gove certainly wants a deal. He's an important player. David Frost and Boris Johnson, I think, want a deal on their terms, and I think Cummings probably doesn't want a deal. So I think this is kind of split amongst the people who matter most. That's that's where I am on Brexit. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, of course, we, we couldn't but agree with uh, what you say. I would just add uh, that um, there is also. Um, a as well as the question of competence, which you uh, mentioned. There is a kind of, um, an overall question of trust, which is an important one. Um, and I think there is a, a perception widely in the EU uh, that the political agreement uh, was not um, uh, faithfully, um, what shall I say, taken into account. Uh, I think we can all understand that um, Negotiating tactics can mean that you try to increase lever leverage by uh, not um, making any concessions until the very last minute. But when that involves apparent um, disregard of a political agreement which was arrived at um, before these negotiations start, um, it has consequences which I think none of us uh, welcome um, when we look at the overall position of Britain and the EU uh, in the future. I think that's right, and I think um, I know that talking to EU governments, that the, the the fact that the British government's kind of gone back on some of what it promised in the political declaration of last October, it has certainly undermined trust in it. I would say that on the, at least on the issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol, there was the big issue of trust because the Prime Minister and his ministers were saying until the spring of this year, well, maybe we won't have to have any controls on goods crossing the Irish Sea. And that, that would obviously go completely against what they promised in not just the political declaration, but actually in the withdrawal agreement itself. Uh, but to be, to be fair to the British government, I mean, my, when Michael Gove took control of that dossier in the spring, he made it quite clear that we would implement, the British would implement the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. There will be controls on goods going across the Irish Sea. So that, that I think is, is, you know, if they hadn't done that, then the trust issue would have been catastrophic. I think. Having done that, it's still, a, as you rightly say, a big issue. The fact that on the political declaration, the British have changed their minds. They no longer want a close structured cooperation on foreign policy and defence, as they promised they would in the political declaration, for example. Uh, and on the structure of the deal, they, they, wouldn't, they said they didn't, wouldn't, wouldn't want to accept an, an overarching governance for the whole system. They went against that, but now they've changed their mind on that. And that's one concession the British have made recently. They've now accepted that the Greek temple model with a set of pillars for each agreement linked by a common system of governance. So I think I think the trust issue is, is, is important, uh, but ultimately it's this, what matters most of all is the substance. And on the substance, the British are going to have to make some compromises to get a deal. And I'm not. I think they probably will, but I can't promise that they will. Yeah, uh, with that we reach the end of our um, uh, encounter today. Um, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, I think. Um, I sense from a lot of people that I've been um, in touch with, and indeed um, my own personal experience, um, there is a lot of positive feeling towards Belarus um, among people that know Belarus and Belarusians, and uh, it's the case in spades for yourself, but I personally could um, join in that too, and um, 
it, it would be um, particularly uh, regret, regrettable if uh, things uh, go to um, the kind of extremes that um, the potential is there for them to do. But uh, we'd like to thank you for uh, being with us today, uh, for your very um, comprehensive and thoughtful analysis of what is going on uh, in Belarus and around Belarus. And uh, as a little bonus at the end, uh, for giving us your thoughts also on breakfast Brexit. <laughs> I thank you on behalf of the Institute and all the participants. Well, thank you. I just made one concluding comment on Belarus. So, so, so I'm glad that I'm very glad that you're having a seminar on Belarus. It is an important country. It's 10 million people, not so far from the EU at all. Uh, borders three EU countries. It is an important country. And while I think, as I said before, we have to recognize the European Union it has limited numbers of levers it can pull, it, nevertheless, it must stay strong and united and committed to its values. And the European values are important. The EU has to stand by those values and stand by the people of Belarus. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you.